I am an IPF patient um, who chooses to treat my disease as a chronic disease that is going to progress and continue to force me to adapt to a new me, as we like to say. I was first diagnosed um, in November of 2010. Uh, I was having a persistent cough. Um, I was actually coughing my lungs out, very sick. An x-ray indicated that I had something called interstitial lung disease. And that was it. That was a that was a warning signal. I got myself immediately referred to an ILD clinic at Toronto General. However, that was only the start of being diagnosed. We knew for sure, unlike in 2005 and 2008 when I had other problems and had undergone testing and nothing was identified, we now had clear indication that I had something seriously wrong with my lungs. But they weren't able to tell exactly what was wrong. So by the time of January, um, when I visited the clinic and they had the ability to look at a high resolution CAT scan, they could only say that they thought it was IPF, okay, or it could possibly be NSIP. And if it was NSIP, that was better news than it was if I had IPF. Okay. And, but at that time, they, they did indicate to me that it had something to do with what the pattern of what they were seeing on the, on the CAT scan. So, I mean, my learning of it has, has, has grown considerably, but it has taken time to get to the diagnosis. I, my doctors chose to treat me as if I had IS, IPF, which at that time meant really doing nothing because there were no drugs to treat it and to wait until my disease progressed. As my disease progressed approximately 18 months later, they decided that the only way they could get additional information to help get to a proper diagnosis or an accurate diagnosis was to do a biopsy, which I proceeded to have in September of 2012, and the result came back with IPF. So you're basically looking at at least a couple of years to get to an accurate diagnosis. And that's quite standard with a lot of patients. It's not like a single test at a particular point in time gives you all the answers you need. But getting that accurate diagnosis um, is very important. It's very frustrating not, not, not being able to get to a quick answer. And patients need to understand that it's, it's, it's a complicated, dynamic, fluid diagnosis that Often it's a best guess. It, it, it fits most of the boxes at this point in time, but we have to wait and see how things develop and as more information becomes available. And human beings want to know, just want to know, what's wrong with me? And that's very frustrating with any disease, but this one is particularly difficult. Particularly. Many people wonder and, and, and question their doctors and say, you tell me to exercise, but how can I do that when I'm short of breath? And my answer is, being short of breath is why you need to exercise. Okay, being short of breath is not going to kill you. It's not going to hurt you. It's an indication that your lungs are struggling. Okay, have you ever watched um, uh, an athlete who's just finished the 500 yard dash? Folks, they're short of breath because they have pushed their body beyond its abilities. And that is when you've got a lung disease, that is what you're doing and that is what's causing the shortness of breath. However, exercising, becoming more active, building up your physical fitness can help with that shortness of breath. It can help you manage it. It can also minimize it. And being short of breath, whether you've got a lung disease or not, it's just a good thing to do. I know a lot of people want to suppress it because doctors will tell you it's the number one complaint the patients have. However, coughing is a natural body's response. It's, it's what your body wants to do to help clear out irritants out of your lung or excess moisture such as phlegm. Um, when you've got an infection in your lung or whatever, you don't want that extra phlegm and, and irritant sitting down there because you've got a petri dish. And next thing you know, you are either going to develop an infection or just make it worse. So I've asked many doctors and, and, and nurses and other medical people, and basically what it seems to have come down to is not necessarily suppressing it, but managing your cough and knowing when it's a good time to or not. I fortunately, my sleep is not, I don't cough when I'm sleeping. 
And that is the number one thing. If you're not getting restorative sleep because you're coughing, you got to suppress it. And that's even what I used to do with my colds. Okay, I'll cough, my nose can run during the day, but I'm suppressing that as much as I can at night because I knew I needed my sleep. Um, the other one is, is sometimes it just, if it goes on too long, it just becomes very tiring. So if it goes on too long at that point in time, you may want to do something to help lessen it or stop it. Um, for some people who are very frail, it could be a matter of the fact that the, the coughing is so violent that they could crack their lip ribs. So learning safer um, coughing techniques such as even holding a pillow to your stomach, uh, for example, or, or doing things that help to keep the, the cough to a more manageable level. So I don't consider it a, um, an all or nothing question. I don't, think you, I don't believe that you should suppress your cough all the time. I think you should manage your cough and, and has, as to how it interferes with your quality of life and your safety. And you just have to somewhat come to terms that is just part of the disease. It's not going to go away entirely. Some people also want to suppress it because of social embarrassment. And I think if you want to go out to a restaurant and be able to enjoy your evening and not worry about your cough for a few hours, I think that's a perfectly good reason to be suppressing your cough. That's my personal opinion, but it, it seems to jive with. It's worked for me and it seems to jive with what doctors also recommend. Naming how we call, di call diseases often are very misleading. Um, actually having IPF became my third chronic disease. First of all, I had uh, fibromyalgia, then I have restless leg syndrome, which is a sleep disorder. When I was first diagnosed with fibromyalgia, it wasn't even called that. It was called fibrositis because they thought it involved inflammation, thus the itis. Then when they realized that no, that name really didn't describe the disease, that it was an ache instead, they renamed it fibromyalgia. So the idiopathic yes means of unknown causes, but there are many other forms of pulmonary fibrosis for which they may suspect a cause, such as an environmental exposure, but they can't really narrow it down to which environmental exposure caused it, or in some cases, they still just don't know. That does not mean that you have IPF. IPF not only requires that they exclude the known causes, but that you also check some other boxes. And the very important one is that there is a particular pattern of lung tissue damage that must be present. It's called UIP. And if you don't at least have those two big boxes checked, then it, it, it's questionable as to whether you have IPF. Now, I have IPF, someone else has PF from another source, and we both don't know what causes it. Big smell. Okay, both diseases suck. The important thing is, is that getting the proper diagnosis and knowing exactly what you have often determines the prognosis and the treatment. So you find so many people are told by their doctor they have pulmonary fibrosis when the doctor doesn't know what causes it. Doesn't necessarily mean it's IPF. Unfortunately, people get on the internet. The, the most popular form um, of PF that's being talked about now is IPF, which probably has the worst prognosis. And now all of a sudden, someone who's actually got a form that has the best prognosis is thinking they have IPF. And, and that sets their mind to having the, the worst scenarios. So you really have to get not only the accurate diagnosis, but understand your diagnosis. So the bottom line is idiopathic sometimes means the idiots just don't know. A patient needs to understand that idiopathic just does, is, is, can be applied to many different cases. Keys to, to, to how I have, to me, successfully managed my disease. Number one is that I believe knowledge is power. Okay, that, that's number one to me. Uh, knowing what's in my future doesn't make it any less scarier, but it puts me in a position to better be able to manage it and for me to participate in the treatment and the decisions. That's number one. That 
Knowledge, I think, also helps to deal with the frustration level. So I know that it isn't just my doctor sloughing me off. I know the diagnosis is going to take time. I know it's going to be frustrating. Um, that helps me manage some of my frustration. One of the other big things I do is we consider IPF to be a terminal diagnosis. I consider it to be a chronic disease. Primarily, that's how I that's how I manage it. That this particular chronic disease is going to progress, and therefore I will have to continually learn to adapt to a new me. All right. Yes, it could very possibly be my cause of death, but life is terminal. You, you hear so many people they go to their doctor and they say, "Well, am I going to die?" And they get offended when a doctor says, "Everyone dies." But you do. Your life is terminal. But as 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 they say, it what comes between birth and death that's important. It's that dash. Okay, we have more control over the chronic portion of our disease than we do on the terminal part of it. And if we can concentrate on that, do everything we can, working with our medical team on our quality of life and managing the chronic part and as living our lives. I think we have a better chance at keeping the frustration down, empowering ourselves, and not missing out on life until it's over. Because we're still alive. Okay, I I make a point of not saying I make a point of saying my death rather than when I stop living. Because when I stop living is when I choose to stop living, and many people do that, but they're not dead yet. Many people are looking also for the silver bullet. They want the one thing, the one pill, the one thing that can happen that will make this nightmare go away or will cure the disease. I have also chosen rather to to look at it as a, a toolbox. Okay, some of the tools that are in that toolbox are there because I put them there, or because my doctor helped put me there, and some of them only my doctor can put there. And. You have to bring all those tools. So it's not any one ingredient; it's the recipe. And I have been through very many exacerbations, and yet I've passed my expiry date of five years. I'm past five years diagnosis. Every time I have an exacerbation, I work with my doctors. It's a reversible one, and we use drugs to get to the reason for the exacerbation. But I wouldn't be here still five years from now. I wouldn't still be doing what I'm doing if I then didn't bring out some of my other tools. Because once the reason is gone, once I'm starting to feel a little better, I get back into my exercise. I build up my stamina. I bring up my resistance. And most of the time, I've been fortunate, even with my lung function, to return to a pre-exacerbation level. And that didn't happen on drugs alone. That happened because I employed other tools in my toolbox. So I've always been my own medical advocate, and I also strongly believe that I head up my own medical team and I participate. And there is so much the doctor can do for me, and there's all of this I can do for myself. And if I'm looking to someone else to solve my problem, then I'm missing out. We have to become involved in our own treatment. We have to take responsibility for doing what we need to do.